Good morning, party people, and welcome to a speed round of office hours where I go through and answer a bunch of really straightforward short questions and really quick response times. Um, CTI Geek asks hey, over in Twitch chat, how has Vegas been during Super Bowl week? I actually left. <laughs> I just got back yesterday. Uh, two days ago, I just got back right before the Super Bowl like kickoff happened uh, because I uh, took off to tell you ride to be out of town during that particular week. Uh, Jessica Phoenix points out that uh, you can't do Amazon Prime certificate or Pr Amazon Prime subscriptions on the, the iOS app, which I find is kind of funny, too. SQL Dev DBA says, good morning. 28 months. Woo! <laughs> You've been putting up with me for 28 months on Twitch. That's absolutely bananas. Thank you for uh, hanging out. So let's go hit out some of these uh, real straightforward questions. So first off, Jose DBA asks, we just started monitoring Always On with Datadog. Any recommendations of what to monitor that's most valuable? Well, the thing is, is, is what you bought was a tool that lets you build your own monitoring kit. You didn't buy a monitoring tool. You bought a set of construction tools that you can use to build a monitoring tool. And if you buy a tool like that, you're always going to be behind trying to go, what am I supposed to, what am I supposed to monitor? Well, what do these numbers mean? You saved a lot of money. You just didn't buy anything worth monitoring. Uh, next up, Bottega asks, Hey Brent, as a database administrator, I have a lot of struggle explaining DevOps how to implement CI, CD. What do you think would be a limitation technically for DevOps? Well, I think you kind of nailed it right there. If you can't explain how to do it, then there are all kinds of limitations. And the thing is, is it's not just about Microsoft SQL Server. All databases struggle with CI, CD. It's not that it can't be done. It's just that there are tons of limitations. Uh, and if you go try to implement it yourself, you'll start to understand what some of those limitations are. Neil asks, hi, uh, reports are searching a Vercare Max audit log column. Is full text search a viable option for this? Well, it all depends on what your queries are looking for. If your queries are looking for English words, then you're going to have a really easy time. If your queries are looking for unusual strings that you wouldn't find in the dictionary, then you're probably going to have a harder term, harder time. Your best bet there is going to be to look at what those queries are, and that'll determine whether full text is a good match for you. Next up, Ozan asks, Hi Brent, what's your experience so far with SQL Server on Linux-based systems? Zero. Uh, carry the one, zero. Um, I, I run a product called SQL Constant Care that does monitoring for thousands of SQL servers around the world. Uh, and I think the last uh, uh, population count we had, there were less than 10 out of 3,000, 4,000 SQL servers. There were less than 10 that were running on Linux. So when you deal with something that's that edge case, it doesn't make sense as a consultant to specialize in something like that. Oh, hey, G-Surgeon. Hey, uh, hello to the Netherlands out there. My T got cold says, do you ever bother with DBA checks? It's relatively new, but I reckon your first responder kit makes it redundant. I have a weirdo consulting job in that I do performance tuning of generally one SQL server at a time. And something like DBA checks doesn't help me tackling just one server at a time, especially doing performance tuning type work. If I was a production DBA that managed hundreds of SQL servers, then absolutely I would be much more interested in DBA checks. But if you only have one server at a time you're working with, it usually isn't that effective. Uh, Mashiko, check out the URL that's there over there on the screen. That's where we take our questions at. DBA Duck, good to see you. Uh, Spitfire, good to see you as well. Next up, Klaus asks, which relational cloud databases have the best separation of compute and storage? I don't go, I don't, I don't look at lots of database, uh, cloud databases and learn their internals, but I'm really tickled with how Amazon Aurora handles that. Um, if you watch from Amazon reInvent, those streams that they do, watch the internals for how Amazon Aurora works, and it separates compute and storage brilliantly, just absolutely phenomenally. 
Uh, Laris asks, in what scenario would you want to create a view without schema bindings? Generally speaking, people do it out of speed and laziness. It's just really easy to go create a view without messing around with schema binding. Um, the other reason that you might want to do it is the tables might change underneath you in a way that might break the view. You might want to just do a, re a view for reporting purposes, and you don't want to break the tables, or you don't want the, the your view to break an alter statement on the tables, especially if you're like building views in a third party application database. Next up, Dougie Fresh asks, what is your opinion of T-SQL T for unit testing? For me, the unit testing that I need to do usually involves around the system DMVs, and T-SQL T can't mock those up. T-SQL T is very labor intensive to set up if it does support your tables. Um, so for me, that the, the What's the, the, there's a slang term for this, like the, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. The amount of work that you have to do is so high, which is sometimes why you'll hear consultants recommending T sequel T, because there's a whole lot of squeeze, and they get paid to do the squeezing. So there you go. Uh, next up in the speed round... <laughs> The Crazy Frog says, aren't you doing the live master classes anymore? No, I put them out for sale for Black Friday, and I think I sold three tickets. It was insane how low the ticket sales were for live classes. So I just said, screw it, I'm not teaching live classes this year, and I'm just updating the mastering course material on my own time uh, rather than having to do it at specific days of the week for the live classes. Uh, next up, DBA asks, Hi, Brent, is it normal to see 10,000 logical reads per execution on an update? Yes, it can be if you have foreign keys set up, if you have triggers set up, lots of indexes, indexes and indexed views set up. It's certainly on the high side for sure, but what you're going to want to do is go take a look at the execution plan to go see what all is happening in that update. You might be surprised at how many things are involved in your relationships and triggers. Uh, next up, the Swedish Chef asks, do you have an easy way to identify a query plan operator as batch mode or row mode? Yes, hover your mouse over it, and it'll say the execution mode. It's either going to be row or batch. Unfortunately, there's no way to see it visually. You have to hover your mouse over each operator. Next up, Mr. Burns asks, have you ever been burned when an end user asked you to delete a table and said it was okay, but then after you dropped the table, things started to break? Yes, what you want to do is don't ever delete objects, rename them. Rename the object, and then that way, and the way I like to do it is underscore to be deleted, underscore a date, put the date in the object name, like to be deleted on... 2024-0601 underscore and then the table name. And I like them that way because it floats to the top and people can go, oh my god, I'm looking at the object list and right there, <laughs> Jessica says sc underscore scream test is hers. I like that. Now they can say, oh my god, no, you can't get rid of the sales table. I need that once a quarter for whatever. And renaming it and floating it to the top will give you that uh, insurance policy there. Adam asks, what's the best way to track down which apps are querying a view? I would guess auditing. I haven't tried that. I haven't tried tracking who's using a view. But I would try auditing uh, and see if that will catch it for you. Next up, Crystal Ball says, it's simple to see the performance impact of a new index on a slow select query in SSMS, but how do you view the new overhead of on uh, the index on inserts, updates, and deletes? Do a set statistics IO on. Set statistics IO on will give you the number of logical reads that were done for that uh, uh, statement, and then you can see those go up. The other thing that you can do is check the amount of blocking that's involved with it. You can use SP who is active get locks equals one to see which locks are being taken by a query. So that way you can do begin tran, execute your insert, update, or delete, and then go run SP who is active with get locks equals one, and you'll go see what the exact locks are by that statement. 
Uh, let's see here. Uh, Biscuits asks, how well does the Azure Postgres offering compare to the Aurora Postgres SQL offering? I don't lay them out like side by side. Generally speaking, if you're going to choose a cloud provider, you do it at a much higher level. You do it like executives choose. We're going with Amazon or we're going with Azure. And then you just got to suck it up and make things work. I believe that Microsoft is going to make massive improvements to their Postgres offering because they bought Citus, uh, this big, massive, I say big, massive, very technically impressive Postgres uh, software shop and consulting firm uh, that did a lot of cool things like sharding built into their version of the database. So I, I like where Microsoft is going with their investments in Postgres. Uh, let's see, next up, Chandwich asks, uh, what's the one part of your online presence you don't like? For me, it's thinking of blog posts. Um, for me, it's dealing with comments from people who clearly didn't read the post. Often I'll get these comments where people are like, yes, but can you just tell me what to do when the blog post clearly tells them what to do? And that kind of gets draining. Boy, if you ever want to see an exhausting version of that, go check out SQLAuthority.com. Uh, Pinal Dave has a, a phenomenal set of blog posts. He used to blog every single day for years. Um, and he has tons of people who read the comments or tons of people who make comments over there. The comment section on his blog is exhausting and he deserves sainthood for having to deal. And SQL Dev DBA says the same thing. Pinal has the patience of a saint. Yeah, he deserves sainthood for having to put up with some of those comments. We'll hit a couple of the newer ones, newer questions that have come in. Moshiko says, hello, Brent. Is there a reason why Microsoft won't release a native version of SQL Server to Apple's new chips? Because they don't have to. It's already supported in Docker. If you go into Do the latest couple of releases of Docker have supported X64 application virtualization. And M1 or M uh, Apple Silicon performance is so fast under those kinds of virtualization that they just don't have to. So there you go. Works fine. I know because I run it. Um, Firat asks, hello from the Netherlands. SQL Server standards should be limited to 128, but when I see uh, when I give it 140, I see it use 140. Yes, um, so it's under certain kinds of queries and certain uses for uh, SQL Server's memory. If you want to learn more about that, search for Google for Bob Ward, W-A-R-D, SQL Server memory, and I believe he's got several YouTube videos from different conferences explaining how SQL Server can go above and beyond 128. It's just not useful for a lot of things that you would really care about. For example, caching data pages. Uh, let's see here. Next up, Toffee says, is there any in any S S software development lifecycle, where does looking at how performant any newer change database codes start? Usually that doesn't happen until after the code's already been deployed. I know a lot of database administrators are like, it should always be part of the design from the beginning. But the simple reality is that tuning SQL code is often very expensive and is it a bit of a niche uh, opportunity or niche skill set. Uh, so you see see it happening later on in the life cycle after the code has already become popular, like lots of users start to rely on it. Uh, next up, PowerPaul says, what is your opinion of using Copilot to write Power BI reports? Has Microsoft finally perfected natural language queries? Not even close. That is a relatively brand new technology, um, and it writes totally crappy queries under most cir circumstances. It just doesn't know enough about your database. Current AI large language models have a relatively limited context. And they can't just go assess the entire database and memorize your entire table structure in a way that makes it useful for them to answer questions. You have to spoon feed them the table structure fairly frequently. Now, so it doesn't work very well. Uh, next up, let's see, oh, uh, uh, Atlantic Rebel, hey, make sure to check out the, the link there for where to do questions. Um, Dodge asks, what are your top three Microsoft abandonware for SQL Server? I don't know that I have a top 
got a three. I'm just going to brain dump a few that I can remember off the top of my head because they're amusing. Um, always on availability groups for Linux for Kubernetes was one that they trotted out and then never actually made it out the door. SQL Server notification services was deprecated after one service pack. Big data clusters was deprecated after one version. But then one of my favorites of all time was English Query. It let you type out what you wanted in plain English uh, out of the database. Go find me all of the socks that are colored blue. And then it would go write the query for that. It was about 25 years ahead of its time. It was like Copilot before there was Copilot. Uh, and then we'll do one more. Let's see here. Uh, Accidental DBA says sometimes when running a database restore, it takes over 30 minutes before any percentage uh, starts to complete. Other times, less than a minute. Uh, well, how should I diagnose? Most of the time, when I see this, it's instant file initialization before uh, per progress percent jumps up. <coughs> SQL Server has to ask the operating system to go zero out the files, uh, making like uh, erase over. I'm not going to try to explain it in a speed round, but it has to go clear out the space in the files. If you want to learn more about it, search for SQL Server Instant File Initialization. It's something that you'll want to have turned on if you do frequent database restores. And all right, there is our speed round for today. Knocked out a ton of questions in uh, about 10 minutes there. Hope that y'all enjoyed it. And for the next uh, office hours, I'm going to try to do one with my Apple Vision Pro. I'm going to try to do the whole uh, office hours with my uh, looking at everything up in the Vision Pro and still doing the, the screencast like this um, and do it as like a from the future kind of thing, which is hilarious. So see y'all later. Hope you have a wonderful week. And now I got to go back to doing my real job. Ugh.